think that consumers need to get their financial house in order uh, to protect themselves from the potential economic vulnerabilities, which I believe lie ahead. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with highly respected economist and bond fund manager Lacey Hunt. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Lacey, in which he explains why a credit crunch is unfolding right now in real time that will materially cool the economy, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Dr. Lacey Hunt. Well, one other thing that you've mentioned a couple of times, but we haven't really, um, I think maybe given it its full shrift here, is the fact that um, bank credit lending is tightening here, right? So this is this is a separate contractionary, powerful contractionary force that is layered on top of what the Federal Reserve is doing here. So how substantial is this and what does history tell us to expect when this happens? Well, it is very interesting. In, in fact, if you look at the 12 month, 24 month and, and 36 month rate of growth in bank credit, which would be loans and investments to the bank, uh, they're all negative. What's, in, what's very significant is that um, money or deposits lead bank credit. The, when, when the Fed throttles back on the money supply, it takes a long time before the banks choke off the lending cycle. Um, and so if you, in fact, you can, you can see it on our charts that the, um, the, the 12 month uh, change in inflation adjusted bank credit uh, is a lagging indicator. It, it doesn't become negative until you're already in the recession. In fact, there are, there are cases where um, bank credit doesn't even decline in a mild recession, or it, it doesn't decline until the end of the recession. Hmm. So the economy is still moving forward. We're not in recession. Um, labor markets are still uh, gaining. Um, but what is unusual is that, that the bank credit, a lagging indicator, is negative in real terms for the last 12, 24, and 36 months. That's very unusual, extremely unusual. So uh, you, have, you have a slowdown in money and bank deposits, you have a contraction in bank credit, and you also have a, a high uh, real policy rate as well. So to hear you say it that way, I sort of think of it as like a perfect storm. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's the fact. Monetary policy works through several channels. One is the policy rate, one is money supply, one is bank credit. In this case, they're all telling you the economy is heading toward uh, economic deterioration. All right, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to- And less inflation. And, and less inflation, okay, great. And, and we'll talk about that in just a minute here because in, in less inflation could mean deflation at some point. And I know that prior to the pandemic, that was the big, morning bell that you were ringing. So I want to give you a chance to sort of comment on that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, I'm going to ask you to prognosticate here, which is in terms of the manifestation of the lag effects from the policy decisions that, that have been implemented over the past year and a half or so, kind of what inning would you put us in, in terms of their expression on our lived experience? You know, are, are, do we have the vast majority of them still to come? Are we midway through the game? What, what do you think? I'm not exactly sure what you're asking me, uh, Adam. Just, just could you just restate the question again? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so the the lag effect of, of policy decisions like oh, okay. uh, the on the interest policy. rate is best. Yeah. I was we're very late in the game, but but the the so this is the this is the seventh quarter since the financial um, the, the maximum point of financial looseness, um, the lag, 
the, the long the longest lags are nine months, uh, nine quarters. So uh, we're very late in the game, but the lags could still persist for another six months or so. Okay, and, and let, let me just ask it again, just to make sure I I, I, I capture what I'm trying to say here, which is um, the the arrival of the impact may operate on a time frame of nine months on average or whatever we want to think it is. But the intensity of the impact may not really, it, 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 that, that may increase exponentially, right? We feel it very little at the beginning, but a lot at the end, right? So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, is how much of the pain that you think we're going to experience from the lag effects have we experienced so far? I would say that the pain has been pretty pronounced in the manufacturing sector, excluding automotive. Uh, the very material decline uh, since last September. Um, there's been a material impact on on gross domestic income, uh, but very but GD, GDP is continuing to rise. So I, I would say that um, uh, the the economy has uh, uh, experienced. Uh, uh, they're, they're, I, I would say they're beginning to feel the pressure, but it's it's not it, we're not close to the to the middle innings by any chance. Okay, and that's sort of where I'm going into this. This video is being watched by kind of regular people, and I'm trying to help them sort of understand what to expect in their own lived experiences. And if we feel that there is potentially substantial layoffs ahead, a real recession ahead, maybe something that pulls today's highly richly valued markets down as a result, you know, that's going to be a lot more pain than, than for sure they've felt so far this year. You know, last well, year wasn't a cakewalk for them, but but this year, you know, a lot of people are saying, phew, I think we dodged a bullet. I think from what I hear you saying is, is no, <laughs> you haven't. I, I would say that we have not dodged a bullet. And I think that um, you can always, you can always get better luck. There can be fortuitous circumstances. Um, the, the fact that we've had poor weather and uh, the energy markets have righted themselves, this is really not a positive for economic activity. It's, it's, not a, it's going to boost the inflation rate a little bit temporarily, but more importantly, it's going to disrupt household budgets at a time when household budgets are already in disarray. Right. Okay. Um, so and I'm not trying to force words in your mouth, but it, it sounds like if I could kind of put some words in your mouth to the average consumer, it might be, now might be a good time to buckle up. Uh, I think that, I think that, uh, I think that that is extremely sound advice. I think that there are a lot of potential risks in the economic uh, outlook here. And uh, it's a time for caution and carefulness. Okay, um, let's let's conclude uh, let me, here by. Let me, oh, let me just make make one little point. Sure. Uh, that that uh, um, <laughs> the according to the numbers that I recently saw, the average credit card loan rate is now over twenty percent. It's the highest it's ever been. You're right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the highest criminal. <laughs> now, uh, what I've said is that the household sector. Is, is either uh, completely unaware of the matter of, of compound interest or else they are in dire straits. Because when you pay a 20% interest rate uh, for a prolonged period of time, uh, if you can go seven or eight years, you're gonna, you're gonna pay more in interest than what you initially borrowed. I mean, this is, this is you're really compounding your problems to be borrowing heavily at 20%. I mean, this is not a smart thing to do. And um, uh, it's, it's a time when the consumer need to, to be pulling back. And I, I believe that that is happening between the banks saying that the loan loss provisions on automobile loans and other types of are rising. Um, but I think that consumers need to get their financial house in order uh, to protect themselves from the potential economic vulnerabilities, which I believe lie ahead. All right, and, and this is why I was kind of digging in with, with these questions, Lacey, here, which is, um, 
uh, before we turn the video on here, you and I were commenting on the the interview I just did with behavioral economist Dan Ariely that that will have run the day before this video um, airs. And you know, we, we talk a lot about the irrational decisions that that people make with money, right? We would expect them to make very rational decisions because everything's so computation. You we're able to compute and, and it's so quantifiable. The credit cards are a case in point. A rational person would not be paying 20%. Exactly. They, they wouldn't be at all. And and what may be going on here, and, and you have the arc of history, so I'm excited to hear your answer here, is that you know consumers, you change behavior one of two ways. Right. You project ahead and say, oh, if I keep doing this, this this bad implication is going to happen. So let me change my behavior today. Sadly, I think it's a minority of people that do that. Most people change because the status quo just becomes so painful to continue that the pain of continuing it eventually exceeds the pain of changing. And so right now, it seems that people, you know, had a, had a lot of help during the pandemic with the money that was mailed directly to them and the forbearance programs and the tax credits and all that stuff. And they shifted their lifestyle or their spending. And now with all that stuff in the rearview mirror, rather than downshifting their lifestyles yet, they're trying to continue it for as long as they can by putting it all on revolving credit. And that can continue only up until a point, right? And then it can't continue any further. And then you really get an injury, not just to household, you know, balance sheets and budgets themselves, but but to the economy, because as you were saying earlier, you know, 70% of our GDP is consumer spending. And so my point is, is you, you tend to, it's sort of like the Hemingway things where you, you, you go broke pretty quickly at the end, right? You know, it's, 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 it, it, you don't see much of a change and then all of a sudden you really do because you just can't continue the status quo anymore. Is that sort of what we're risking here right now? No, I, I think so. And, but that's the nature of recessions. Uh, uh, I wrote a book in 1987 called Time to be Rich. It was published by Matt Millen. I don't know what it made anybody else rich, but it was, it, it, it helped me out a little bit. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, and uh, what I basically talk about is the five stages of the business cycle. And people, uh, and this is the way I would describe it. An expansion has three phases, revival, acceleration, and maturation. Revival is when you come out of a recession. Uh, acceleration is the nice part of the middle part of the curve when the inflation rate is still coming down a little bit or stabilizing, but the economic, the real economic indicators are accelerating. That's the boom and everybody loves. Yep. That's what we all love, live for. And then there's maturation and it, inflation starts accelerating and the real growth rate turns sideways. Um, the recession has two phases. Um, the first is called ease off and which uh, the economy begins to decline, but it's not really clear that it's declining until uh, long after the fact. And in fact, the, the most uh, concrete that I can say about maturation and ease off is that the statistics look almost identical. Um, the lagging indicators are remain are the strongest component in both maturation and ease off. The leading indicators are deteriorating, and the cons the coincident indicators are are mixed. So, what do we have now? Well, you have some of the components of the economy declining, like industrial production, gross domestic income, the Chicago Fed's National Activity Index, and so forth. But the overall economy is continuing to grow. But the second phase of the recession is called plunge. I call it plunge and the economy just breaks and you have a waterfall. And, and so um, we, we often go through a process in which people will say the recession is not coming, that this time is different because the initial impact to the inflation and the monetary response don't seem to congeal, but ultimately they do. So okay. plan comes after ease off and that's what we haven't seen yet. Okay, and it feels like we're right on that cusp right now. I think you know, we're, we're moving there. And, and this, this uh, upturn in the commodity prices and the cost of basic necessities, which we may see in June, uh, in July, and maybe perhaps in August, 
if this commodity surge does not continue, it continues, then that will add to the problems. It does not solve the problems. Okay. And I want to score this because, you know, if we're looking at, at headlines, right, we're seeing a lot of headlines of, hey, the most expected recession in the world never happened. And, and maybe we dodged that bullet. And, and using just sort of wealthy on as a, a data set, I would say in the past couple of weeks, month or so, you know, we've seen a, a surge in comments of people saying, hey, all these people that were on your channel that were kind of, you know, advising caution of, of what lay ahead, you know, later this year, um, you know, those guys are all wrong, right? You guys have, have, have missed the mark. You know, we're in this great new rally and uh, you guys have just been way too bearish. And, and look, I, I, I can't ignore what the markets have done. The markets have, have had a pretty, you know, vicious uh, start to the year so far, first half of the year. Um, but it does not seem like from a, a macro standpoint that we are out of the woods. And what you're providing here is, you know, bo both the, the academic economic explanation for what to expect, but also just your understanding of history where you've said, look, this is this is kind of what we expect to see. We, we see these these sort of declarations of a false dawn right before we get to your your waterfall. Well, I, I'm not a stock market investor and I don't venture there with my opinion, but I personally do not believe the stock market is a good indicator. I know there's a wide variety of people who believe the stock market is the economy. But the fact of the matter is, at the last critical turning points, uh, the stock market provided no warning or only the, the barest of, of, of warnings, maybe of a few weeks or very limited. Um, take the Great Depression of 1929. Uh, the recession, uh, the, the Great Depression started in September. The stock market did not buckle until October mm -hmm. of 29. Um, the, the, the stock market, uh, there, there may be a wealth effect, but it only applies to a very small percentage of our people. The vast, the vast majority of our people do not have a, a sufficient holding in the stock market to, to be a benefit to them. Uh, it is true that we can look at the screens and see whether it's red or green, but it doesn't mean that whether it's green or red, that that is pointing to where the economy is heading. And, and we have to look to these economic indicators. And I think that there are a lot of people that would like to presume that uh, red, uh, red versus green is all I need to know. Well, no, that's not the way, and it has not worked out that way uh, historically and particularly so uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, the stock market has not been a leading indicator. And it, to me, it's not an important, that's why I don't discuss it as an economic indicator. All right. Well, these are my words, not yours, but but from what I hear you saying is, is you know, the stock market really can be sort of the wily e. coyote uh, at, at economic turning points where it, it can it can walk in midair for for a while after the economy has plunged uh, and deceiving people because it's still hovering there in midair, but eventually it has to catch up to what the economy is doing. I, I just don't think it's a good indicator. I would not be guided by it. That'd be my rep, that'd be my recommendation to your viewers. All right. Well, let, let's let's begin to wrap this up. Thank you for giving us so much of your time, and this has been my yet pleasure. again just another fantastic discussion, Lacey. My pleasure. Um, and and we, we've really been light on charts, and, and I'm going to talk in a moment about our upcoming conference in the fall, but but when you give your presentations, your keynotes uh, at, at our conferences, and you walk through all the supporting data of the charts to what we're talking about here, like I said, it's like a, it's literally like a graduate level presentation you offer, um, but you, you, you don't, and I understand why you, you don't talk much about stock market and make predictions about it and whatnot, but you do manage a bond fund. Yes, um, and so you have to pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the bond world. And I believe at Hoisington, you're, you, you mostly specialize in, in treasuries. We only do. We only, we are only investors in treasuries. Okay. So, uh, from, from your vantage point as a fund manager, where do you see treasury yields heading in the future? We believe that the trend is downward and we believe we have a long duration and, um, uh, the our long duration product uh, does have a gain for this year. We had a, a loss last year. We're not happy with, uh, but we we believe, in spite of the mixed nature of the of the economy, we believe the critical forward elements, 
the ones that will ultimately determine, indicate that a long duration portfolio is warranted. Another thing that I might add, we haven't talked about it, uh, is that we have a very highly inverted yield curve. Mm-hmm. The short rates are on top of the long. Well, um, by the way, when you have an inverted yield curve, and we've, we've had it now for more than a year, an extremely long time, there were times uh, in the last four to six weeks in which the spread between the two-year and the 10-year was more positive than any time since the 1980s. Well, the, the inverted yield curve serves to reinforce the decline in money supply bank credit and the consequences of a high real policy rate. Because not only the banks, but the non-bank entities, the shadow banks, they make a profit by borrowing short and lending long. They, they can't do that when the yield right. curve is inverted. But the, the other thing that investors should be aware of is that these inversions of the yield curve, particularly those that have been extreme, and this is now an extreme inversion, um, have typically preceded a very substantial reduction in long-term yields. Is there a is there a direct relationship between the extremity of the inversion and the extremity of the decline in yields? When they do? It, it's you have to weigh all the factors. It, it, there's no there's no single shot uh, explanation, but it, it it's it, it's present in, in very important uh, periods of declining. In other words, the, the inverted yield curve, the longer and steeper that the inversion is, it, it generally tends to coincide with significant declines, although there have been a few cases where the declines were only modest. But, but it, it, it hinges heavily on what are the initial conditions. And in this particular case, I, as I've cited to you before, I do not believe the initial conditions are favorably either domestically or globally. Okay. And uh, this is not individual investment advice for anybody watching this, but I'm just curious from your tenure as a, as a bond fund manager focusing on U.S. Treasuries, I would think that this may be a particularly attractive period to be investing in, or at least considering investing in Treasuries for two reasons. One, they're finally paying you something again, <laughs> right? So you're getting a nice return. It's actually a real return right yes, now, it which it hasn't returned a real return in a long time. And you know better than I on that. And you have, while you're waiting to see how this plays out, you're, you're getting paid. But but if yields actually come down and you're, you're in long duration treasuries right now, A, you're getting paid and B, there's that optionality that you will, you will realize as the price rises, as yields in the marketplace come down. If it- this is just a theoretical computation, not a promise of anything, but if the long treasury yield in the 30 year were to come down 100 basis points, uh, then you would have a total return of 20% in addition to the coupon. So there you go. Right. So sitting in a safe instrument uh, and getting a coupon. So uh, I, again, I don't really want to put words in your mouth, but is is from the arc of your career investing in U.S. treasuries, is is this a year you're perhaps more excited to be investing in. The only, the only time that, I, I, that I personally, there, there was an instance when I was more excited was in 1981 when I was at the Fidelity Bank in Philadelphia and, and we were able to purchase the long treasuries uh, close to 15%. Percent, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you had a wonderful tailwind behind you for the next yeah, 40 we years. Did. We did. Yeah. All right. Well, look, um, Lacey, I, I, again, I can't thank you. We've gone My way pleasure. over time. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I know we're going to get a lot of uh, <laughs> strong support in the comments for this. So, um, well, look, in, in wrapping up, um, I, I just want to let folks know about two things. Um, one is that, again, a reminder that you will be uh, the keynote speaker at Wealthion's upcoming conference in October. It's Saturday, November 21st, if I'm remembering the date right. Uh, secondly, as I said earlier, we will make this quarterly letter uh, of Lacey's available at wealthion.com slash Lacey. You can download it for free or go to well, uh, Lacey's website, read it there and see all the other resources that he has at that very excellent website. Lacey, thanks so much. Um, I really, pleasure. really appreciate this. Great questions, Adam. All the best to you. All right. We'll see you in October.
All right. Well, now's the time of the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the endorsed financial advisory firms by Wealthion, to react to what Lacey just said in this interview, as well as update us on what's been going on in the markets over the past week. I'm joined this week by John Lodra. Uh, his partner, Mike Preston, has the week off. John, great to see you. What were some of your key takeaways from the discussion with Lacey? Hello, Adam. Uh, great to be with you again, and always a treat to hear, hear Lacey and his decades of uh, balanced wisdom uh, be shared with us. Uh, really enjoy his his talk. Um, Lacey, I think, uh, did a very good job at helping us dive beneath the surface of a lot of headline news flashes that um, can, can be taken out of context. Um, for example, um, he talked about how if you look at the recent uh, uh, GDP numbers at 2.5%, I think, uh, a full, about 2% of that 2.5%, 80%, in other words, was attributable to uh, very strong activity in the automobile sector, which, uh, in his surmising, uh, was basically the last sector to really catch up from the, the COVID slowdown. And uh, we've already seen auto the auto sector start to hit the skids a bit, um, with car prices coming down and inventories going up. So uh, just one of the, the very many um, nuanced beneath the surface data points he, he, he helped us uh, uh, pull out. Uh, he did talk about, yeah, we've we've seen an economy that's trucking along here, but um, when you look beneath the surface, like, for example, he referred to the uh, Chicago Fed uh, National Activity Index. There's something like 80 different components there, and um, uh, in June, only 30 of those component, components were advancing. The rest were, were declining. So there's a, uh, and I think in the, to paraphrase, there's a beneath the surface um there's a narrowing of the economic um, uh, advancing, uh, and and that typically uh, is is very typical of a of a of an economy that's that's starting to slow down and see some some uh, trouble on the horizon, and it's frankly it's not unlike what we see in in stock markets when they get exuberant. We see and and this has been the headline of this year, and and fr frankly every really major bubble top market almost always is defined by a, a, a narrowing of, of the leadership of just a handful of typically story stocks, meme stocks, whatever you want to call them, uh, a tri you know, uh, basically um, owning most of the, the index advance. And, and underneath the surface, you have a broader uh, deterioration of, of stocks and sectors. Now, we have seen, as we've talked about, a broadening of the, of the stock market advance since, since about June, early mid-June, but still very heavily uh, concentrated in just a handful of stocks. Um, but, um, you know, Lacey did uh, also talk about his, you know, uh, similar to, to what some of your other guests have talked about, the the, the lag nature of, of how monetary and, and financial conditions transmit through the economy. And he talked about a financial cycle leading a business cycle, which then ultimately um, goes into a, a uh, price and labor cycle. Um, he pins late uh, fourth quarter of 2021 as as probably this cycle's top in the financial cycle, and it's not uh, surprising. That's when the the, the recent uh, all time highs were were achieved in, in stock markets. To be seen if we take those out uh, with with recent advances and uh, near term uh, direction of the stock market. But from there, he um, I think nicely um, pointed out that no one cycle is always the same. So as much as we want to pinpoint you know, what is the lag, typical lag? There's a inherently a range to that because of the way that nuances are different in every cycle. But he um, said pretty robustly that typically you see about a seven to nine quarter lag between a, a financial cycle peaking and the business cycle uh, peaking. And that would put us right now uh, in, in the seventh quarter. So we're right in the, in the zone for what you know, we and many of your guests, and certainly Lacey is, uh, is amongst those, uh, right in the zone for a, a a lagged kind of timing for us to see real market slowdowns in some some area key areas of the economy. You know, right in this next this quarter, um, fourth quarter of this year, and early into next year. So all those things kind of uh, line up with a lot of the things we, we've been saying, and and um, you know, the inherent imprecision of timing these lags means that sometimes. Calls can be early and positionings can be early, but uh, you know he talked about the the credit cycle starting to show some real uh, slowdowns. You know the money supply has been falling off a cliff. 
I just saw the latest chart of M2. You know, I think the pace of decline is going back to like 1933, the last time uh, we've seen that that uh, level of, of deceleration in M2 money supply. But that invariably leads a slowdown in credit uh, creation and, and credit extension. Banks have have and lenders and both traditional banks and and um, shadow banks off 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 uh, mainstream uh, sources of credit have 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 started to pull in their horns. We've seen a contraction in credit and that flows th through to, to things in the broader economy. So uh, really interesting talk from him and that he is the first to say he's not a market uh, uh, tactician. He's more of an economic. Uh, and he, I think, shares what we share that the market oftentimes is a very, very poor indicator of what's going on in the real economy. And absolutely, we think this market is absolutely untethered from uh, certainly from a valuation standpoint to to the true health of the underlying economy and the durability of of the the advance we've seen uh, this year in, in markets. So I'll, I'll stop there, Adam. I'm sure we got plenty of jump off points from from there. Yeah, no, great summarization. And, and Lacey, you know, I sort of look as, as Lacey is like a master mechanic, right? Like, so he he doesn't get, like you said, he, he doesn't really spend a lot of time looking at the markets because he doesn't think they're a good indicator. Uh, as he said several times, um, but what he does is he, you know, he, he take the analogy with the car. You don't really get distracted by what models are popular right now or, or what the new fad color is. He's popping up the hood. He's looking in the engine and he's saying, "Okay, look, I can tell you specifically what's going on right here." And um, he is one of the most uh, experienced and respected economists alive today. Uh, and you know, he just looks at all the data. It's not, it's, he's not slinging opinion. <laughs> you know, he's, he's really digging into the, the economic data and saying, look, this is what I see. And, you know, in his own words, he said, look, I think we're going into a credit crunch here. Right. So, um, you know, what, what I, what I valued from the conversation was there's been a lot of pushback, I think from um, the, what I'll call sort of the casual investor who was very happy with the highly fed interventionary uh, time period following the global financial crisis, where for over 10 years, they could just kind of ride the market, right? You could just go along, you could buy the dips and you were doing great. And it was pretty easy and everybody got real comfortable with that, right? Um, and you didn't really have to pay attention to what the markets were doing, except just to kind of embrace the sentiment that, you know, everything's awesome. Um, then 2022 arrived and it forced people to have to care and to have to start paying attention to how they were allocated, right? And some of them were kind of dragged kicking and screaming to have to kind of resume that type of responsibility for their, their investing allocations. And then lo and behold, you know, 2023 starts, the markets catch fire by Q2 and everybody is is hoping to be able to go back to the way that things were. And they're saying, hey, you macro guys that are talking about all these concerns, you guys just don't get it. You know, we, we've made it through the storm and, and the sun's out and everything's going to be great from here. Um, lag effect? What, what lag effect are you talking about? It's, it's you know, now been a year and a half since the Fed started hiking interest rates and, and everything's getting good again, right? So there's this sense that people want to just sort of, you know, wrap the the comfort of what they enjoyed, uh, you know, in, in the post GFC decade around themselves. And understandably, you know, they're, they're looking at what the markets are doing and saying, hey, look, there's a lot of money to be made here. And those of you that are, you know, pointing out warning signs, you're missing the boat and, uh, and you're going to miss the party, right? And I can't deny what the markets are doing. And absolutely, there's been money to be made in this market. And probably there still will be for some time here. But I think what I heard Lacey say is, guys, this is a false promise. Um, looking at the data here, the lag effect is absolutely going to express itself here. And if you just dig a little bit below the headline numbers, just like if you get a car with a new fancy paint job, but you pop open the hood and actually look on what's going on, you can see that there's a lot of things that aren't working well and are likely to get worse from here, right? So it was very validating I think of the folks that watch the macro data and and saying, look, yes, we should be really concerned about this data. And there are shoes that are going to drop. Um, and the only other thing I want to add to that is um, I watched uh, recently a uh, interview that Jeremy Grantham gave with David Rosenberg, 
really good discussion. And just a quick note for folks, um, I used to write summary notes of these interviews on Wealthion. We're just doing so many and you know, with growing the business and running the business, I just haven't had the capacity to do that going forward or up in you know in this year. Um, I'm hoping to be able to bring that back at some point. Um, but I did spend some time sitting down and writing up my notes to this this Grantham interview with with Dave Rosenberg, uh, and I'm making that available on my Substack, which is something that I'm just playing around with right now. So if you're interested in reading those notes of that interview, uh, go to Substack. Just type in my name. You should find it that way. Um, but what Grantham said, uh, John is, is, you know, he, he is a study of the market, a student of the markets. And he said that, uh, you know, we have had several great bubbles in history, one of which we are potentially seeing bursting right now, he believes so. And he says, you have to analyze those very differently from all the other regular bull market cycles, because they're so distinct. And if you, if you look at the burstings of them, they they all tend to follow a very similar pattern where you see the most speculative assets get hit the most first. And that's what we saw in 2022 with all the high flying growth stocks. But then you see kind of a recovery, usually in January of, of, of the next year, as all the tax loss sellings occurred and all the proceeds are then looking around and saying, oh, well, we now have these bargain values in these former darlings. Well, let's put money back into them. And they they shoot up again. So what Grantham is seeing, and to a large extent to what Lacey is seeing, is yes, we have this sort of like what they would call sort of a false summer right now in terms of, of, of the markets and sentiment and whatnot, but they're saying we would expect to see this at this stage. And what we expect to see coming next from the progression of history that these very seasoned investors have seen several times is you then start to see all these other shoes start to drop, oftentimes catching the people who all fled flooded back into the market by complete surprise because they thought the storm was ending, but when it was actually really just beginning to get underway. So you've been nodding a bit as I've been saying this, John, but I'd love to hear your comments on it. Yeah, I know exactly the uh, the interview you sp speak of there, Adam. I listened to, I think it was several weeks ago, but I may, I may be off on the timing, but it was, it was fabulous. I mean, uh, Jeremy Grantham and David Rosenberg are, are both um, multi-decade uh, sages of, of market cycles. And uh, um, one of the key points you teased out there that Jeremy Grantham makes is that there are, you know, the vast majority of financial market history, you can kind of lump together as kind of normal times, right? Uh, yeah, they're going to go through cycles, ups and downs, but they're kind of relatively um, homogenous from a data standpoint and a behavior standpoint. But every once in a while, and very rare, you get these super bubbles and, frankly, super sell-offs. Uh, and those two episodes are very rare. The super bubbles, the super overvaluations are very rare. I forget what percentage of financial market history you said, maybe 5% or 10%, some small number. And, and you can't lump those in, as, as history will be your teacher. You can't lump those in and make the same kind of conclusions or takeaways as other times in market cycles. And the same thing can be sold to his credit. He, he makes the point he's not a perma bear. In fact, he's one of the very few people that uh, called ma many of the major bubble tops, but also was very pounding the table of, hey, now's the time to be buying like like he was in um, in um, in late 08, early 09 uh, after the housing bust. Um, but the reason I bring this up is if you look at the market action this year, first of all, it's it's uh, been a market that up until the last month or so has been defined by a small handful of stocks. We talked about this ag nauseum over, over uh, in conversations with you and other guests you've had, you know, seven, eight stocks, the, the magnificent seven. If you look at uh, through about the beginning of June, you take those seven stocks, they were all the gains in, in the S&P 500. The rest of the 493 were actually flat to, I think, a little down on the year. Up And, and since that time, we've had a, a broadening out of sorts. So it's not just those stocks, but it's still very much the bulk of the gains have, have been concentrated in these very small handful of stocks. Um, but this is a market that has gone higher almost exclusively on what we call multiple expansion, uh, not an increase in earnings. In fact, earnings, you know, uh, numbers and estimates were, were, were reduced going into the second quarter. Um, so you had a complete rally basically this year on on multiple expansion and the, the layperson's take uh, interpretation of that is the expensive just got more expensive it's not like things suddenly became undervalued and and deserved to be bid up in price to a more fair value 
quite simply, the expensive got more expensive. And, and, and that is all well and good, but if you don't have the economic follow through to justify that, which even if we did have some, you know, plotting along here, we're still at multiples and valuations that are uh, parallel, you know, only been seen a, a few times in history on, on objective measures. But the problem with this is we're seeing a lot of um, momentum headlines and, and FOMO headlines. Like, for example, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is coming off, I forget how many days of, of straight straight days of, of gains, daily gains. And it was like the longest streak in maybe history or in 50 years or some, some rare event. It's only been like two or three other times in all of financial history. And, and yet, um, such a small sample size of, of those few times in history that's happened. And, and there's folks out there saying, well, in, in the other two times this has happened, next six months later, it was always, uh, always uh, for, the market was always higher. Well, first of all, that's not a very big data sample to, 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 to you know, from the standpoint, we sit uh, managing clients' hard-earned retirement money to be wagering a big, big bet of one's hard-earned savings on, you know, well, it happened twice before in history, so maybe this third time is going to happen again. But it also uh, pays no recognition as to uh, valuation levels and other really important um, uh, data points uh, comparing this current time versus the other time. So a lot of careless, frankly, headline grabbing stuff that that uh, misses the point that Grantham makes that there are times where you cannot compare other periods of financial market history because they're just so out there on the extremes uh, and, and, and comparisons to prior episodes of this or that just aren't even uh, apples to apples. They're complete uh, apples and oranges. All right. Well, look, you know, I think it's it's super important to be listening to these greats of investing who have seen so many market cycles and, and seen more of these extreme elements that you were talking about, these moments that you were talking about, John, which are a small slice of the market. And so many just sort of average armchair investors just kind of assume the same playbook's going to going to work where oftentimes it doesn't because these things are, are, are very distinct. So anyways, go watch that interview, read my notes on Substack if you want to get the key takeaways. Um, and, uh, you know, back to what we talked about with Lacey here. Um, Lacey did a great job of, um, it's funny, I used this term in the, the interview I just did with, with Dan Ariely about behavioral economics. Um, but he did a great job of making the invisible visible here, right? Like, you know, pulling up the data and showing us what's going on um, with money supply, with bank lending, with um, real rates, um, with uh, productivity, um, all of which have massive implications. And it's probably worth talking about productivity for a second here, because, you know, in Lacey's words, he's like, that's pretty much the whole ball of wax. Um, you got to look at where productivity is going and productivity has been weakening uh, substantially. And in Lacey's words, it's like there's really only one way at this point that you can fix that is uh, you have to can't remember the exact term you use. Maybe it was rationalize uh, the workforce, which is e economists speak for layoffs. Right. You've, you basically got to bring the, the, the cost of your workforce um, into better alignment with with its volume of production. Um, and so, you know, I was talking, you know, with, with Lacey in the interview about like, okay, well, you know, what does that mean for real people? And what what type of, you know, future are we seeing here? And he said, look, you know, you're going to see a pretty bad recession, right? He said, he also made the comment that that um, periods of extreme inflation generally beget periods of extreme recession, right? So these are important developments or shoes that are likely to drop in the future. These are developments that are that are likely to come out of the progression that we're seeing here. And I just want to flag too that, you know, Lacey is telling us this, but this is exactly what we've heard from Cycles folks like um, uh, Lakshman Atuchin, um, Michael Kantrowitz and his HOPE framework, um, Eric Basmajan, uh, who has a, a riff off of that, where you know they look at the leading indicators, they look at the coincident indicators, they look at the lagging indicators, and you can see them sort of rippling through time, right? Where the leading indicators have cratered, even in employment, but the coincident and the lagging ones, to a certain extent, are taking longer as you would expect them to. But it doesn't mean they're not going to fall in the same direction. It's just the progression for how these things work, right? So um, you know, when I asked Lacey about do you do you see recession and layoffs? as basically inevitable at this point, my interpretation of his answer was, that, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I really do. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to give people the impression this is all going to happen tomorrow. 
uh, we're going to wake up and the market's going to be down some massive amount overnight. Um, but what I am saying is, is um, we, we do seem to be, uh, if you look at the headlines, uh, you definitely seem to be in, in danger of convincing yourself that the future is going to be less risky and rosier than what these very smart experts uh, are telling us it is likely to be based upon both historical precedent and what the data is telling them as it's unfolding right now. So, um, you know, again, I'm not telling people necessarily don't be long, but I'm saying if you are long, you really should have a plan in place for um, why you're long and what you're going to do if indeed some of the things that Lacey talked about confidently is likely to happen in the future do start happening. And this is the world that you live in, John. So you got to help people navigate this on a, you know, that's what you do for a living. Yeah, absolutely. And and here's the thing. Uh, we are in a momentum driven market, which, uh, you know, we, we uh, investment advisors, market strategists can, can bury people a lot of, you know, uh, sophisticated sounding terms, but momentum is, is a really uh, powerful thing in markets. Sometimes though, um, it, it deserves to be called what it should be called. Um, th there's a point where momentum becomes FOMO and performance chasing. And if you go back to the major psychological faux pas of investors and investment advisors and managers for that matter, uh, it's it's chasing performance late in a, in a move higher and selling out out of, out of fear and panic at, at the bottoms. So um, there's real, real important nuance here. Momentum in a market that's at more reasonable valuations yeah, that's a that's a tool to encourage folks to put a bit more of their chips into a, a stock posture. Uh, but when we're at valuations and extremities and, and narrowness like we've seen now, um, our our feeling is is that that's that's a pretty large wager to be making for you know money that people our clients don't get a do over. This is money that is all the money they're ever going to get, more or less. They've sacrificed their their during their working years to save and and forego instant gratification so that they can have a secure future and and um to use a you know thing like a momentum indicator as 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 if it were a foolproof um uh, blessing to to overstay a a, a very uh, extended market that there is huge context there that is is got to be taken into account so we're you know nothing wrong with following momentum but position sizing is is really important you know Moving ten percent into a momentum-driven, um, you know, strategy is a whole lot different than mo moving one hundred percent or seventy percent or sixty percent. Um, the consequences could be dramatically different depending on on what happens and where we are in the cycle. Um, and and to to your, your you know Lacey's comment about um, you know the economic uh, reconciliation by companies, um, we're already starting to see it. I mean, I I have seen I, I saw it today over my 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 screen uh, flashed the quarterly. Revenue growth, year over year quarterly revenue growth of uh, Robert Half, which is a behemoth uh, staffing company. They do temporary placements of, of professional and other staffing. And you know, typically in a normal business cycle, companies will obviously hire permanent employees to to right size their workforce for the for the business that they have and expect. But they'll around the fringes um, optimize their workforce by taking on temporary workers, you know, be it a computer programmer for a, a nine month deployment that rather than hire someone full time, you get, you know, very skilled computer programmer to come in and through a temp agency like Robert Half. Um, quarter over year over year quarterly revenue growth has fallen off a cliff. Uh, it's, it's negative uh, for the first three quarter, the first two quarters of this year. The only other times in the last uh, 15, almost 20 years that I see in this chart was during the COVID meltdown and uh, the 08, 09. So this is, we're starting to see it. Companies are starting to rationalize the, the simple areas first, saying, hey, no more temp placements. We, we're, we're having a hard time rationalizing our permanent workforce. So absolutely, I think there's the, the high likelihood of follow through to uh, weakening in the jobs. And, and in fact, as a lagging indicator, if you go back and look at um, almost every recession, the jobs numbers actually look pretty good at the beginning of a, a, a recession. They do. Kind of in hindsight. And they actually tend to bottom. They look their worst. When recessions are are bottoming coming out, so it's it's a very and, and I think David uh, tried to put a, a time frame on you know that you got the financial cycle, you got the business cycle, and then you got the labor and price cycle. I think he said the the labor and price cycle typically lags the business cycle about one to two quarters. So that would put later this year into the first half of last year of maybe where we'll see 
um, the most per, you know prominent impacts if there's going to be some in, in in the labor market. So um, re really, these are the things that move slowly through the economy, and, and you can't help but uh, just to to point to the massive amounts of distortions that understandably are going to have some weird effects on on these things playing out like they should in theory, right? Uh, you know, one, thing, one, one other thing I wanted to mention is, is um, you, you know, to your point about, um, you know, uh, people that we work with. I mean, it's it's ultimately it comes back to their lives. You know, um, I can tell you almost categorically, most most clients are going to be uh, the biggest risk they have is not um, waiting for the last bit of juice in an overvalued market. The biggest risk they're going to have is um, suffering a decline that takes off years of uh if not decades of, of their financial security uh and and definitely the the with valuations where they are and the extent extents of, of the markets the there's definitely a skew to the the longer term downside than upside in our in our very strong opinion based on the data yeah and based on that again you know we're not telling people not to go long here right but we're telling people if you do um have a plan in place for if it if it turns out that we are late in the cycle of this kind of relief rally here, whatever you want to call this rally uh, that we've seen so far in 2023. Um, and it's, it's also worth noting too, John, you've made this comment many times on this channel, but Jeremy Grantham made this, this comment too, uh, pointedly in his interview, which is that, um, uh, you know, in some of these mega busts that we've seen from these great bubbles, um, those busts have been punctuated by some of the biggest rallies that we've ever seen on record, you know, rallies of, of 20, 30, 40% or whatnot, as the bust is happening, these rallies are happening, you know, as it's going on. So again, they, they sort of provide false hope and they get people who've been sitting on the sidelines, you know, back in or people who, you know, thought the worst was over, start, you know, increasing their long exposure. And then the bear comes back in with its claws to, to drag everything down further. Again, not saying that that's definitely going to happen here, but saying that very smart people see precedent for this and see the patterns that are playing out right now to be very similar uh, to what we've seen in the past. Hey, John, we, we definitely should just note uh, while we're talking here that uh, about an hour before we hopped on here, uh, the Fed announced that um, it indeed was doing another quarter um, point rate hike, uh, 25 basis point rate hike, which was expected. Um, in the comments following that, you know, it, 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 uh, Powell is, is saying, Hey, you know, we're, we still are likely going to hike again here, folks. So I just want to say that if you listen to the preponderance of what Lacey said, of all the things that are weighing on the economy right now, the fed is still ratcheting up <laughs> the, the, the pain, if you will, right. It's, it's still ratcheting up the force of gravity that it's trying to pull the economic growth down with in order to keep inflation under control. So it's kind of like, yeah, everything Lacey just said, but even more <laughs> going forward. Um, and there's two other things I want to mention on that. One is there's what the central banks are doing, of course, and then there's what the banks themselves are doing. Um, they're tightening their lending standards. And this is on top of what the central banks are doing. So, you know, Powell has been very clear in warning that like, hey, I'm doing all this stuff. But the uh, on top of that, the tightening that the banks are doing, those substitute as additional rate hikes for what we as the Fed, you know, might be doing. So be aware, folks, that all this stuff is pulling down uh, gravitationally economic growth. And that's why Powell himself has been talking a lot about the lag effect. So it's not just us, you know, it's, it's the policymakers themselves. Um, but Lacey, in his recent article, um, he, he just he points out what's what is historically aberrant about the, the tightening we're seeing right now. He says, in previous cycles, real bank credit did not turn negative on a one-year basis until the economy was already in recession. Even in the global financial crisis recession, the 12-month change in real bank credit did not decrease until the end of the recession. Um, he then says, but the latest 12, 24, and 36 months rate of change in real bank credit are all negative. Um, he says, as the second quarter ended, the contraction in bank credit shows showed the markings of an old-fashioned credit crunch. So, you know, what Lacey is saying is we're seeing bank credit tightening so much right now that it actually is beginning to create a credit crunch. Of course, 
credit really is the whole enchilada in terms of how the economy goes. And when the credit markets start to have issues, that's when the economy really starts to have big issues. And he's basically just saying, we're seeing a worse deterioration of credit conditions right now, even before we necessarily enter recession than we saw in the past big recession. So that's a massive warning flag. Um, I'll let you comment on that, but I'll, I'll mention one more thing just so you can, can react to it too, if you like, which is um, one of the things that I wish I'd had a chance to talk with Lacey about, but I just didn't see the data until after we've recorded, was um, you would think with uh, debt, you know, debt rates, you know, rates on debt, interest rates going up as, as extremely and as swiftly as they have, that that would start increasing interest expense at corporations, and that would start depressing corporate margins. But instead, we've seen the opposite so far. And that's been a real head scratcher. Um, but the the answer, the explanation for that is that companies, you know, and it makes sense, when rates were super low, <clears throat> they levered up and got as much cheap debt as they could. So they're still basically servicing that cheap debt that they have on the books. Right. At the same time, since yields have really increased, they've taken their corporate cash and they've stored that in treasuries and you know other short-term uh, facilities that are now giving them a real a new and much greater return on their cash. So they're kind of winning on both ends. They're paying low interest expense and they're getting more cash uh, interest getting paid back to them, right? Which is great. The problem is that's all temporary, right? as time goes on, more and more of those corporations are going to have to go out and refinance and their interest rates are going to re-rate in most cases, probably around two times as high, right? Twice as high as what they were paying. So this is one of those things where people are like, yeah, the lag effect, what lag effect? Like everything's going fine. This is sort of an artificial, you know, benefit, little window of benefit that these companies are getting. But unavoidably, that debt is going to have to reprice and that is going to really whack corporate margins, right? So we know empirically that that's coming, but it's one of those things you have to just sort of dig a little bit under the, the hood to really understand what's going on here. So, you know, we've got this issue of um, uh, this unfolding potential credit crunch, and we have things like these re-ratings re that are just going to make it, you know, substantially worse going forward. So you've been nodding as I've been saying all this, John, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And this is to <clears throat> Lacey's point. You said every cycle has its its unique differences. And, and one difference in this one, it has been the, the massive uh, dr driving down of interest rates and the massive leveraging up by corporations at those low interest rates. And it's all well and good until that debt comes due. And the two options are either to refinance at whatever the pre pre prevailing uh, interest rates are, probably quite a bit higher than where that debt was taken out or paid down, which is a big, big sucking sound of all that corporate liquidity. You know, many investment strategists have always touted, oh, cash on the balance sheet, or maybe, you know, even more pointedly, over the last several years, co corporate stock buybacks have been all the rage. You know, great when you have free cash to do that, but if you got to divert that cash to paying down debt that's ready to mature at much higher interest rates, you know, say goodbye to that. Um, so, so yeah, and, and uh, even even though we haven't even seen that wave of of debt maturity come come due, because there was a massive amount of corporate debt uh, issued uh, at, at those low rates, uh, we're seeing a notable uh, uptick in corporate bankruptcies. Uh, there's been a, a a pretty sharp rise in corporate bank, and this is even before you know the real credit crunch has happened. Just saw today a, a, a headline about uh, the healthcare sector, for example. Uh, now that they've they're off the life support, excuse the pun, of, of COVID uh, stimulus uh, to, to respond to the, the COVID emergency. Uh, healthcare bankruptcy, healthcare uh, company bankruptcies are, are uh, spiking higher. Um, so these are all things that are, are playing out kind of before our eyes and really haven't made it into the markets yet. One of the things I like about Lacey is he, you know, he's, he's very um, schooled in all the deep economic thought, but he also brings just some real practical observations. Like, so for example, um, we can debate all day long about corporate profit margins and, and earnings estimates. What we do know is that uh, quarterly earnings are oftentimes a circus show because CFOs and you know financial accounting gimmicks can can you know make earnings reports look 
better or worse, usually better than the, the reality really holds in, in a longer term sense. Um, but, you know, look look at a real data point. And you pointed this out, and I think you have, Adam, too. You look at the actual tax receipts uh, by the Treasury. Um, you know, the, the tax receipts on earnings have, have gone down. So uh, either companies are, you know, playing games and avoiding taxes, which, you know, they certainly do plenty of that. But, you know, the earnings seem to be dropping off a cliff or, or the, the net earnings anyways. Um, and, and, and that's a real data point. Look at a couple of other, you know, he didn't mention this, but, you know, look at a couple sectors that have, have gone gang, gangbusters this year. Uh, the semiconductor sector has gone gangbusters higher stock prices. Yet um, you can look at semiconductor uh, chip inventories. They've gone through the roof, meaning there's, there's all this dead inventory that's not getting sold. I think you have to go back to like the the, the uh, housing bust to think, maybe even tech bubble to see similar kinds of spikes in inventory. So here you have a hot sector, but you know all all this activity is just showing up in inventory. Same thing with um, the consumer. You know, consumer discretionary sector has been one of the hottest sectors this year. Um, yet you've got retail sales dropping off a cliff. You got you know, even just on the on the ground indicators like uh, cardboard box shipments. You know, most things that people consume today is not walking into a retail store, but going on Amazon and getting a cardboard box shipped to you and, and they've fallen off a cliff. So there's, you can sometimes get lost in the, the, the lingo and the data, you know, promulgations of, of folks like us. But if you just look at the, the readings on the street, that oftentimes gives you a pretty good uh, clue as to what's really going on, uh, despite all the hand-waving. That, that, that's a great point. And, um, and again, this is one of those situations where the headline numbers can be deceiving. So like a lot of, you know, gross retail sales, GDP, stuff like that. Um, it, it's it's influenced by the price inflation that we've seen over the past two years because it's reported in dollars, right? Um, I don't have the chart handy here, um, but there's a chart I saw recently that showed uh, retail sales on a unit basis. Um, and those have been in pretty sharp decline, right? Which basically is just showing that, okay, people are buying fewer things. Now, the overall retail sales numbers aren't coming down as much because they're factoring in the price inflation. People are just paying higher prices for fewer things. And so the number's not changing quite as much. But if you look at just on a unit basis, the slowdown is is, is really pretty sharp. And, and we've seen a number of warnings this year issued by companies in the logistics space that are in the business of just shipping real things you know, to real places from point A to point B. Uh, we've had warnings from FedEx. We've had warnings from UPS, You know, other big international shippers in the US here. This week, I think we're seeing the bankruptcy looks like of Yellow, which is a a short haul uh, trucking company. Uh, and yes, they've got some issues with their unions and whatnot uh, that are kind of complicating the situation. But a big issue is, is that they were unable to meet some of their, their pension payments because they're just not making enough money, right? So um, we, we, to your point, when we're really looking at kind of the practical indicators, they're telling us a, a pretty clear story here. Um, all right. Well, look, um, we got to wrap things up here in the interest of time. Um, thanks so much for another great week here, John. Um, folks, a couple quick resources for you. One, a reminder that much of the discussion with Lacey was based upon the Q2 letter that he wrote to Hoisington's investors. Uh, he's very generously made that letter available to the general public. And so if you'd like to get a copy on it and read it yourself, just go to Wealthion.com slash Lacey. You can read it there for free. Um, secondly, uh, as we say every week, you know, everything that Lacey told us about just basically said, look, you should have a plan going forward for managing your portfolio here, particularly if you're going to be invested long in, in assets. And uh, we just highly recommend, as we normally do, that, that the vast majority of people watching this program should do that, working under the guidance and in, in the with the partnership of a professional financial advisor who's good, number one, but also who really does take into account all the issues that Lacey talked about here. If you've got a good one who's doing that for you, putting together a personalized portfolio plan for you and then implementing it for you while keeping you well-informed, absolutely stick with them. They are pretty much priceless. Uh, but if you don't have one, or if you'd like uh, a second opinion from one who does, maybe even John and his team there at New Harbor Financial, then consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses. To do that, just go fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. These consultations are free. They don't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with these advisors. It's just a public service they offer to help as many people position themselves as prudently as possible before the additional shoes that Lacey thinks may happen start falling. 
All right, John. With that, um, thanks so much for hanging with me for yet another week. Look forward to seeing you next week. I'll let you have the last word here. Um, any parting bits of advice for folks, especially given all of the, the folks that you guys talk to every day over at New Harbor with their concerns about the current market environment? Yeah, thank you, Adam. And and, and thank you folks for, for listening and watching. Um, we have the opportunity to talk to a lot of people, many of whom do become clients, but um, our conversations aren't about sales. They're about consultations with real people about their real lives. Um, yeah, we talk about markets, but invariably the focus of the conversation is about uh, the specifics of each uh, individual or couple or family that we, we talk to. So it oftentimes, uh, you know, obviously we'll have questions about markets, but it's really bringing back to there, you know, could be a, a, a someone that's approaching retirement and they want to know uh, what their options are for their pension plan. And they maybe can take a lump sum or this, or that, or should I take social security? We go through uh, the math and, 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 and analyze things that really relate to, to their situation. So, you know, we find that uh, if we just uh, try to, have an objective conversation. Uh, if there's a good good fit and folks feel that we can add value, then uh, we're, we're uh, privileged oftentimes to have those folks become our clients, but it's never never a sales uh, sales call for us. It's just uh, us trying to share our, our perspective, our insights, and um, the rest takes care of itself. All right, John. Um, thanks so much. And, and just to, again, underscore your message there, uh, who knows what the future is going to bring, but there's the old saying that uh, the best time to patch your roof is when the sun is shining. Uh, while we have this moment in the markets where everything feels great uh, and we're not entirely sure how long it's going to last, um, this is the right time to be having all of those types of discussions with John. You know, the first one being, hey, you know, how's my portfolio positioned if things start getting rockier from here in the future? Uh, but once that discussion has been held, then just go through all the other things that John was talking about, just the real life money events, money needs as my retirement planning coming along. You know, if I've got a plan for college for my kids, how's that going? I've got to got to take care of an aging parent. Am I resourced to do that? I mean, just all the things that you guys talk day in and day out with, with your uh, your clients there. Um, all right. Well, look, um, in wrapping up here, folks, if you've enjoyed this interview, if uh, you'd like to see Lacey come back on the channel, um, if you enjoy these weekly uh, updates and check-ins with John and his team there at New Harbor, please do us a favor, support this channel by hitting the like button and clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Uh, John, thanks so much, buddy. Look forward to seeing you next week. Everyone else, thanks so much for watching. Thank you, Adam. Always a pleasure. And we'll see you next week. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth and because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we've put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA but for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-US clients. All right, with all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com 
to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching. Thank you.